Right. So we'll give people a few minutes to, to jump in here. Ronnie, thanks for joining. I know we had some technical issues. Zoom loves to update at the worst possible time. It's always like right when you're starting a meeting and Zoom's like, hey, now's a good time for a system update. So anyway, it's good to see you live and got everything sorted out here now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, see people starting to join here. Uh, as a reminder for everyone, um, these episodes are going to be posted on YouTube. We're on Spotify, Apple Music. Um, so feel free to listen to these later on. I see a lot of people we know. Uh, see Jeff from Northside Pool, Kayla, uh, Regal, Justin, John, Dustin, Buck, Brian, Andrew. Welcome. Feel free to chat in questions as we kind of go through this. And um, yeah, uh, Ronnie, excited to have you on. We had a lot of sign-ups for your episodes. So a lot, a lot of people are interested in uh, what you're building at Coker Rental Company. So thanks for coming on here today. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me. Hopefully I can um, provide a little bit of insight. I've had I've had so many great mentors, you know, over the seven years that we've been doing this. So anything that I can share to help anybody else, I'm happy to do. For sure. And I love that about you. You've always been, um, I know you're involved with ARA. We'll get to some of that later on. Uh, you've always been trying to give back to the industry. Um, on a positive note, I don't know if we ever talked about this. Are you? I know you're in Tennessee. Are you a Tennessee uh, baseball fan, UT fan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would love to go to more games, but I was screaming at the TV uh, Monday night. So we're, uh, you know, we're happy to bring home a national championship for the baseball team. Congratulations. I saw every time I go on Twitter, it's like, uh, all I see is the lime, the, 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 the off colored orange everywhere celebrating the big yeah. Tennessee baseball win. So congratulations on that this week. Yeah. No, that was, that was definitely pleasant to bring home. Though I mean, you know, the team's been great for the, the past four years. You know, Coach Vitello has done a great job with them. So I, you know, it's, it's really, really pleasant for them to bring that home. Yeah. Well, exciting stuff. So let's go ahead and jump in here. Um, you know, what I love about your story is, you know, you really bootstrapped this. Even, even this morning, we were talking about, uh, yeah, you, know, you don't have an office because you're putting every dollar into your business. And here we are, you're sitting in your truck because you're, you know, on job sites, you're traveling, et cetera. So um, you were the success story. We talked a lot of rental companies are just getting started. I believe you're, uh, what, almost eight or nine years in. Is that right? Yeah, we're in year seven, uh, going about to roll into eight shortly after that. So I'd love to just start off. How'd you get into the rental business your first year? Some of the ups and downs. What really made you start your rental business? And we sort of talked through how the last eight years have gone to where you are today. Um, love to hear sort of your journey into the into the rental business. Yeah. So before we jump into to rental, we really got to take a step back. So um, my, my story starts with Ace Hardware. My family's been an Ace Hardware dealer for about 60 plus years. Um we opened up a second location whenever I was about 21. I started managing that. And it's it's really where I get my, my service mindset from and, and everything that I do. It comes from from the ACE way of, of retailing. We uh, we happened to be at a, a retailer group meeting up in Townsend, Tennessee, and the guy was, was renting some equipment. And I, you know, I, I happened to talk to him. I said, hey, you know what you got going on here? And he gave me a card. Uh, to the guy, he was just doing re-rents. And I was like, man, that'd work out perfectly for the hardware store. People, they need equipment. They're, they're you know, digging ditches to put pipe in there, whatever it is, you know, drilling holes. They, they need it. And I was like, that would be a great addition to our hardware store. So I, I got that card, called the guy up, and you know, it kind of just took off from there. We we re-rented for about three of our seven years, maybe, maybe three and a half of our seven years that we've been in business. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And then eventually the re rent model, it's not profitable to, to, to do with a physical storefront. So we, we started buying our own equipment. One thing led to another. And here we are today. You know, we're, gosh, we're, we're probably, we've grown it from nothing to about four and a half million dollars of fleet. Uh, we just moved into a, a new location that's on about four plus acres, 10,000 square foot building that we service uh, our shop and our showroom out of. And, and like you said, you know, that conversation we had, you know, we're, we're boot, boot, bootstrapping everything that we have that we can. Uh, you know, if, if I wasn't in my truck talking to you, I'd be standing at the, the rental counter and that would be an absolute nightmare. People calling, walking in. Th- this would this would be a pretty, pretty boring show. Of course, it may be pretty, pretty lively, though. Yeah, I think it'd be entertaining. I don't know how educational it'd be, but I think we have a lot of yeah. interesting conversations. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, look, we got a fancy office here in my Zoom background. That I work from home. We're remote. So I get it. You know, you, you got to put every dollar again into the business. Some of the overhead, you can cut back on it make sense especially when you're you know you're you're early and you know year seven you're eight you're sort of across the the chasm like a lot of companies they'll make it three years five years you've sort of gone to the other side of it what's been some of the challenges you know your first few years like what were some of the things that you were dealing with you know year two year three imagine a lot of sleepless nights were there ever points that you were like hey are we gonna make this or we like, what are we doing here or is this gonna be a business in six months did you have any of those sort of existential questions along the way 
Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you know, lucky for me, I had the blessing of of having my background at Ace. So I, you know, I had a lot of management and financial experience uh, in things. But just because you have the experience doesn't mean that you're going to bring in the dollars. You know, so yeah, yeah. There was a lot of sleepless nights. I would say probably the the hardest hurdle um, was was getting that employee base in there, getting the, your team to buy in and and getting people when you're first starting out you know it's it's hard to pay people truly what they're worth and 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 such so that, that was probably the hardest thing was was getting a, an employee base and and getting a team getting a team in, in place to to really start to where you could grow operations and, and function properly but i mean on the flip side of that you know the financial aspect just because you've got experience you know that doesn't put money in the bank and it doesn't take care of bills that need to be taken care of so yeah they're gosh they were there's been times up through year six that I'm like, oh, where's the cash going to come from? But I, I attribute all that to my faith in God. You know. Okay. Can you can you see me? I uh, can't see you, but we can hear you. It sounds like you had some wireless issues, internet issues. No, my iPhone temperature spiked up and it shut the phone down. All right. You all good now? I, I hope so. I've got it on the air condition, so we'll see if it holds. Okay. All um, right. So we sort of lost you. You were talking about some of the challenges you had, hiring challenges financial challenges, you know, where you cut off a sort of, you talk about your faith in God and sort of how you attribute a lot of that to that, that then we lost you after that part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I attribute, you know, the, the success and, and where we're at today to, to God. I mean, if, if we weren't destined to be in the spa that we're in, I, he wouldn't have made a way. So he's made a way and, and we're at where we're, where we are today because of him. And I, yeah, you know, I have to attribute that to. Yeah, that's great. So I, I'm thinking about some of the challenges you've talked about hiring, and then the financial aspect. Have you? Did you ever consider taking on um, like debt or equity investment? We've we've had other guests talk about that. Have you been bootstrapped the entire process? How do you think about that decision? So we, I mean, we definitely took on debt. Uh, we didn't take on any equity or anything from any outside partners. So you know, it's it's a hundred percent me and my wife. Uh, but you know, to to grow from so essentially, we've been in business for seven seven ish years. But to go from re renting and then start buying your equipment. So from virtually year four to year seven, you know, going from nothing to, to a four and a half million dollar fleet, you've got to take on some debt to to do it. So um a lot of those were honestly equipment manufacturers loans because at the time, two thousand nineteen and into twenty twenty, those loans were zero percent. So you were taking on free money. Did you take on any debt the first three years or did you not start until year four when you really tried to accelerate to the next level? Yeah, we didn't take on any debt until about year four when we started buying our own equipment. And if you look back over the last seven, eight years, you've had a ton of success. In fact, we're having this conversation. You're, you've been growing so well. You know, you, you've been a very successful rental business owner. What would you have done differently going back to, to day zero? Knowing what you know now, you know, how would you have done things differently? What would you have done the same as well? Uh, well, I mean, one thing that stands out like a sore thumb um, and, and not to not to call out any companies, but we uh, we we. Uh, during the pandemic, we, we needed to buy more machines. You know, the business exploded. We bought some John Deere track loaders and and uh, turned out to be kind of a fatal flaw in, in our operation. Uh, our service calls went through the nose. So we did what we had to do because it was what was available. But, you know, if I had the choice to buy something else, I probably would have bought a different piece of equipment, knowing what I know now. Um, and and it's, it's unfortunate because our dealer locally was fantastic. We had a great sales rep, great parts represented. Uh, I mean, you know, and I'm sure most everybody else has the same relationship with with their dealers. You know, we had everybody's personal cell phone number, texting back and forth when you needed something. Um, so that's one thing I probably would have done differently. But hindsight being 2020, what it is. Hindsight know, being 2020, been, also the year 2020 when you made those uh, decisions sounds like. <laughs> yeah. So um, outside of that, you know, everything's been really good. Like I mentioned earlier, I've had so many people influence decisions for me give me advice and people that you could tell that were really sincere um one of one of my favorite people in the world his name's mark larch he's uh he's he pretty much only reps barreto now but he works for a uh, big eight tool and supply and man me and him had some really long conversations and, and he gave me some great advice and you know positive advice and, and he wasn't trying to sell me anything. He, he was le- just generally trying to help me and I think he sold me more by trying to help me than what he ever could. It was just straight up trying to sell me something. Hmm. So it sounds like when you sort of stumbled into this at Ace Hardware, you, you didn't have a ton of rental experience, but you've learned along the way 
trial and error, making bad decisions, making good decisions, but also being mentored and, you know, getting advice from peers and people in the industry. How important has that been to your success? Yeah. So I, I had zero rental industry uh, experience. Uh, you know, my my dad is a contractor outside of, of the ACE world. So I've got a ton of just general equipment, construction industry experience from that. But, you know, coming coming into rental, it, it was kind of a, kind of a, a you know, I, I was really green is, is probably the way to say it. Uh, and and it had it not been for the, the advice and help from everybody else, and even, you know, the ARA itself is a tremendous resource. So, you know, I I try not to approach any situation with that, that I know it all because I don't. I clearly know that. And just just having that humility to listen to people and, and, you know, see what works for them. And on that same note, just because it works for them doesn't mean it's going to work for you. But you can take so many of these pieces and, and you can put the puzzle together however you need to, you know, to make your success. Mm. Well, that humility aspect is is huge. I, you know, you can always learn something from someone. I was, I think Abraham Lincoln had a different view. He was like, you know, I, I learned something from every everyone I meet. Often, what not to do. <laughs> Sometimes you can also learn from <laughs> people's mistakes too. Um, but I, so, you know, I just thinking about you're new to the rental industry. You're kind of getting started. How did you find these mentors, these peers? Like, how did you uh, build these relationships with these people? Who've been so helpful to you over the last few years. Oh, let's see. So. When we first decided to start buying our own stuff, uh, I guess the, the very first piece of equipment we bought was from Kubota. And our rep from Kubota actually uh, worked for uh, a, a fairly good sized outfit called Neff Rental. They, they were bought out several, several years ago, maybe even a decade or two ago. So, you know, just so happens he was pretty good family friend. So we started talking. He gave me a ton of good advice, things to look at. He, he actually gave me... Uh, about six or eight folders from Neff about operations, utilization, just all kinds of things, things that you generally just wouldn't know, just pop it. So you know, I was very fortunate to, to have that just kind of laid on my lap where I could just look back through all this data and see what made a good rental operation. Mm. And then, you know, slowly but surely, we're, you know, we're doing that. I um, I bought a Beretto machine also, and, and at the time, Mark was not my rep for Beretto, but slowly after that, he became the rep. We, we were looking to buy some more Beretto machines, and then I got connected to him. And then um, another good guy, Kyle Martian, uh, he, he stopped by one day on a whim, so now that's that's how we have Weber Compaction. And shortly after that, joined ARA, you know, started going to, to events. And and I, I know that, that ARA events take time out of people's day, but I swear they're worth it. I, I mean... Even if it's a, a three or four hour event in the evening, I think everybody should, should try to make the time to go to it. I was at an ARA event in, in Tennessee over at All Occasion Party Rentals uh, at Terry Turner's shop. And we were just standing in a group and everybody was talking about their peer group. I just asked the, the question, you know, there is no stupid question, but I, I said, what, what is the peer group? You know, one thing led to another. And now I've been at a peer group for, I guess, about two years now. And that's been just it's been an abundant amount of information that we share as a peer group that you get out of the peer industry. Uh, even even if people aren't in your, your peer group, I mean, I still talk to all kinds of guys every week. Yeah, I think, you know, your episode number 24, we're going to keep doing these every every two weeks, but there's been a common thread. I don't, I don't know how many, um, you know, there's different flavors of peer groups. We've had, the, we've had Dan Crowley on as a guest. He runs, obviously, the peer executive group. They have probably several hundred members. There's a strong correlation I see with successful rental operators and people who are members of a peer executive group. Um, you know, we see that correlation pretty strong. I think people are willing to take the time to think and reflect about their business. There's a lot of value in that. I mean, how important is that as the peer group been to you? What are some of the things you've learned in the last few years that you would not have learned if you had not been part of the a, a peer group? So when I first joined um, our first meeting or two, they were virtual. Mm-hmm. After our virtual ones, uh, and I think it's where I met you, first time was in Scottsdale at the Top Gun Awards. So we had some classes there in Scottsdale. We had our peer group meetings. Uh, I actually met, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher his name, so i just probably going to say his first name. Uh, I, think it, I think it's Army, Amy, Ar- he's with Multifunding. Uh, yeah, Ami Kazar. Yeah, Ami. Um, he was our guest, episode number 10 here. He came on too. Yeah, so I met him there. Uh, you know, kind of figured out what they did, and and we actually used multi funding uh, 
last year to to do a, an SBA loan to, to just kind of encapsulate everything into one payment to make life a little bit more simple for us. Uh, so that was that was a huge nugget that I wouldn't have really known who to contact outside of a local bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, multi funding just they had their hands in so many places, they had so many connections that it was such it was honestly it was an easy process if you can call an SBA funding loan easy. Yeah, the, all, the information's out there, right? I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people trying to figure this out on their own. That's one way to do it. But I mean, you don't, don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think peer groups is one avenue of many. The ARA events, you know, are awesome. We were in Texas last week, the Texas uh, rental show they had. And we, we started to go to the state level events because it's just great to be with, with people in the industry. And there's so much knowledge sharing, best practices. Everyone's sort of, you know, looking at the nationals, right? They have billions of dollars of resources, but the independents, you know, there's like a knowledge sharing that can sort of benefit everyone because, you know, you will compete with, the, you know, other independents. But for the most part, we're sort of all in this together. And that's what I really like about the peer groups is, you know, obviously they take people from non-competing territories and put them in pods of whatever, eight or 10 people. And there's this free sharing of information where we can all, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. Right. And I think that's what I've really enjoyed. Um, just sort of loosely watching what's happening in the peer groups and, you know, everyone who's a member raves about it. And, you know, it sounds like a lot of your success, even in the last few years, you would attribute to some of the things you've learned from those groups. Yeah. Yeah. And, and kind of goes back, you know, I don't have all the mouse traps. So I want to get back to one of the things you, you talked about earlier. Uh, when you were looking, you know, the guy you mentioned from NAF Rental and you're um, sharing these documents with you. And the question you asked yourself was, what, what makes a good rental operation? And you're sort of looking through all this data and you sort of come to your own conclusions. And now you've been running your own business for seven or eight years. I guess my my question to you is, if you had to sort of put a bow on it, what would you say makes a good rental business? I, I mean, I think what what sets us apart is, is service. I think that's what makes us, you know, outside of having good, reliable, I think service is definitely key, especially if you're looking to compete. I'm not sure exactly. if that's... If, I'm not sure if that's how you were looking for a, for an answer. If you were looking for more, maybe a, a financial operational answer. But well, I want your answer. You, you you've been running rental business seven years. I want I want your answer. Sounds like you know you lead with service. How do you deliver that? How do you actually in practice deliver a superior service relative to your competitors? What does that mean? Yeah, so I, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, actually. So we we kind of have this philosophy of whether you spend you know. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year with us, or or five hundred dollars a year. We're going to offer you that same level of service, mm-hmm. and we're not we're not looking to necessarily treat anybody special. We're looked down on anybody. So out, outside of that, you know, we're, you know, we're treating everybody equally. We're providing just as fast a service as we can, whether it's at the counter, on phone calls, giving quotes, whether a, a machine breaks down in the field. You know, we're we're trying to get out there as fast as we can to fix it or swap it, whatever needs to happen. To, to keep the job side up and running for the customer. So about being fast, responsive, and treating all customers the same. That's not something every company in the world would say. You know, there's like higher paying customers or low paying customers. And some people would say the higher higher paying customers get better service. Like if you fly first class on an airline, you get treated differently than where I fly, back middle seat, you know, economy. And that's not that's not your perspective. You know, you you want to really strive to treat every customer the same. Um, why why do you choose to do that? Yeah. So I mean it goes back to my, my time with Ace and service there. I mean, it, gosh, it, it's it's hard for me to, to wrap it up in words. Just the, the way that I feel about people and trying to, to make sure everybody's treated equally. Yeah. Um, I, I may have to come back to you with a, a better answer on that. Yeah, but there, there, is, there is one quote that, that I've loved, and I, I couldn't tell you who said it. I can't give credit to anybody. It's just something I've remembered over the years it's, you, know, you you treat the, the CEO the same way you treat the janitor. And I look at that in all aspects of life that I can. Mm. Well, was, that sounds like it's core to who you are. You know, you, you've started off from the very beginning today, you talked about service mindset, right? And that's sort of ingrained in who you are. And part of that mindset is treating people the same. And that doesn't matter who you are, right? Um, I really like that. And it's interesting hearing different perspectives. I remember, you know, uh, I know you're a Tennessee fan, but um, forgive me, but Nick Saban, Alabama, he, you know, with his players, which is different than customers, but treating his team, he said, I promise I would treat everyone fairly, but I will not treat everyone equally. And his perspective was like, if you're our best player, you're going to have different perks, different, um, you know, you're set, if you're the star quarterback, you're doing the Heisman, you're different than the walk on receiver in terms of, you know, resources you'll be given, practice reps, et cetera. But what he did, you know, 
although he didn't treat every player equally, he did treat everyone fairly. And you have the right to become that top player, right? Everyone has the, that opportunity. Um, so I, I, this is a different flavor on sort of what you're talking about. But the bottom line is you at least treat everyone fairly and you do what's right. And if you're the janitor, or the CEO, or you're making, you're doing like a running an aerator versus large piece of equipment, you're going to treat customers with a very high level uh, level of customer service. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we just, we want to raise the bar on customer service. I mean, not, not to say that it's just a flat line and everybody gets the same. I mean, we're, we're taking what's standard and trying to elevate it. One of the, one of the things you talked about earlier, one of your earlier challenges was on hiring. Um, and obviously like you're, you know, you can't, uh, you're not the only one, you know, d- delivering customer service to your, to your customers. I'm curious, how, how many employees do you have now? And how have you thought about recruiting and retaining people? Because it's been yeah, that's the story we've heard from a lot of people. It's hard to find great talent. Yeah, I mean it's it's been it's been easier over the past three years. Um, when we first got started, it was it was me and uh, I had I had taken one of my ace employees and hired him on the rental yard. So it was two of us, you know, running for the first let's say two years, and then you, you jump into year three and four. We had another guy kind of part time looking to help out, and finally the past. Like I said, two or three years, it's been a lot easier. And, I mean, the main reason it's been easier is, you know, you, you make more money, you're able to afford to pay people more, and, and your job looks more lucrative. And especially over the past two years, we've been able to offer benefits to, to employees, whether, you know, that be, be healthcare, 401k, life insurance, whatever it may be. And, and then you, you, your your job starts to look more like instead of just a, a temporary. You know, if you can, the more you can make it look like a career for somebody, better off you're going to be getting talent and retaining talent. Yeah. So as your business has grown, you've been able to have more resources to reinvest into your people, into your business. Um, are you still having a hard time finding, finding people? Or do you feel like now you've sort of uh, built up the brand, the company that you can sort of get the people you want now? Yeah, it, it's not been too bad. We had two guys leave us uh, kind of on a whim. They both worked out two week notices, but we, we threw some ads out on Indeed, posted on social media, and we were able to fill those positions within two or three days. So I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't say that, that it's been too terrible of, of a time to find employees. We've got a winning business and people want to work for winning teams. So that's probably helps, right? If your business is doing well, it's easier to retain people, attract people and the sort of uh, snowballs from there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you just kind of touched on the branding and, you know, it, uh, at, at first it, it wasn't like, you know, the forefront of my mind, but the, the longer that we get into it, the more the brand makes a difference, the more it matters, the more you stand out. Um, nine times out of 10, when I'm out in public, I've, I've got on, on my poker hat. Um, I, I usually have on some kind of different poker t-shirt, whether it be something custom that we made or something, but I mean, people notice and, and then that, that service and what's, what, how do I want to phrase this? Your, your reputation, it, it starts to, to get out there. People, but they, they notice. Hmm. That's the long game, right? You got to protect your reputation at all costs over a long period of time. Right. Um, and that's what's hard to you can't build that in six months. It takes a decade to build. It does. Yeah, it, it's not it is not a, a short game. You know, reputation and how people view you is a long term play. Because, I mean, you know, you, you can get all your Google reviews that you want. You're going to get a lot of good ones and, and some mixed ones. So time time will tell the story. Late the branding. Someone actually chatted in a question. Uh, do you have a budget? to give away any branded half t-shirts to your customers or at different events. And, you know, someone said, I, I found that could be pretty expensive pretty quickly. Have you, have you thought about that? It's a pretty tactical branding question, but. Yeah. Yeah. So we give away hats left and right. Um, I, I would imagine most days we give away six to eight hats. And I mean, here, here's the oh. deal. You don't, you do not give away cheap hats. Nobody's going to wear it. Mm. You can buy a cheap hat for three or $4. Certainly. My my goal with with giving away hats is to to have people actually wear them out in public. They're not going to do it with those cheap hats. So I mean, we invest in a, a good hat. We we get the the Richardson one twelves, and some of them we have uh, custom patches all on, and then some we do embroidery. Uh, we do different color styles. Uh, if I was in the showroom, I'd pick up a couple and show you guys. But right now we've got four different color styles that we do for hats. But, um. To, to dive into that question, I don't I don't necessarily put a budget on it. Um, currently, right right now, we bought like two thousand hats. Wow. We bought oh yeah, and, and I mean we'll give out those. It'll take a year to get them out, but I'll go to a show. I 
20 hats, 25 hats. I'm like, okay, it's a big deal, but you're about 2,000. You're giving them out left and right. Have you seen a return on that? Like, you know, obviously you're not running charity here. Like, what, what, why, why do you do that? Yeah. So, you know, our average cost on a hat is about $11 to give one away. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I kind of look at it as, as maybe uh, your cost of a customer acquisition. And, you know, for people, whether they're walking in and actually renting something for the first time or they, you know, they spend a lot of money with you renting stuff. I mean, as long as they don't try to take five or six hats at a time, we're not making a deal out of it. If you want one or two hats, we're more than happy to give it to you. Uh, and it, it's really hard to quantify the return, honestly, um, outside of just seeing your hats. If that, that's probably the only way I can quantify it is just actually see people wearing the hats. Yeah. Well, off the trade, next time I see you, I'll give you a Quipley hat, give me a Tucker hat, and we'll call it a deal. Although your hat probably more valuable than mine. <laughs> I, nah, hey, I, I started traveling with them a couple years ago. Uh, I I think I went to my first ARA show in, in uh, Vegas at 21 and I had one of my hats on and one of the vendors asked me, she's like, I love your hat. I was like, it's like, I would give you one, but I don't have any extra with me. So now I start carrying it with me when I go to shows. I need to, I need to do that. People love, like, I just, not that we're special either, but like people just love branded company stuff. Like, you know, I have people all the time. Can I get a t-shirt? Can I get a hat? So we started ordering more. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you say that. So, I mean, we, kind of just started giving away t-shirts too. Uh, granted on, uh, on that side of things, my wife makes, makes our t-shirts. So that, that makes it a little bit more economical. So that's actually another chatting question. I think people are interested in your branded items. Someone asked, do you give it things outside of hats or t-shirts? Have you tried hard hat stickers, calendars, anything else you've used to stand out? Uh, koozies, carpenter pencils, license plates. Uh, since I'm right here, I'll hop out real quick. And now I will say license plates are, are very expensive so maybe not for everybody but all right see that that's awesome yeah like the coker license but people listening on spotify right now can't see it but uh you got a coker license plate free free branding everywhere you drive hold tight i gotta connect you back to my bluetooth the people who who are listening in we've got uh coker hats t-shirts uh license plates stickers sounds like you've been I mean, it sounds like it's been paying for itself, right? Like the fact that you've ordered 2,000 hats, tell me that free branding, free marketing for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hats, t-shirts, carpenters, pencils, koozies. Um, the license plates are a huge hit. People love them. They're just, they're really expensive. They're like custom license plates, like the one I showed you guys. They're like 30 or 40 bucks a piece. Yeah. Uh, Save that for you and special <laughs> employees. Why? Well, hey, one of the other topics I wanted to get into was your marketing strategy. So I think we previously talked about that. We talked a lot around companies who are not doing anything on, on, on internet marketing. They're not doing inbound marketing. They're not doing digital advertising. They're not doing SEO. They're not posting on Google and Facebook. They're not generating Google reviews. Uh, that was one of the things I was impressed with from our initial conversation. That's something you guys have invested in. Talk to me about, you know, we've talked about the branding side, giving out hats, the in-person marketing, right? Talk to me about what you guys are doing on the internet side of things too. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's almost kind of the mindset of, of, starting another business at, at at some level because it takes a significant investment not only financially but you know your time as well to, to get it all set up um to dive into that uh an, another shout out to to the peer executive group in scottsdale i uh i, I met a company called uh, local iq and uh, we've been working with them now for I guess this will be our going on our like two and a half year mark and that, I mean, it's been phenomenal. They they handle all of our Google advertising. They handle our Facebook retargeting ads. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't come without its cost. I mean, at one location, we're spending $2,500 a month on that, you know, just, just to get our name out there and to continue you know, pushing your, your name in front of people. And that $2,500, uh, part of that is like the var- variable spend you're spending on Facebook and Google. Part of that is the services for the group to run your ads. Is that right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know how it's exactly broke down, but essentially, yeah. So Facebook ads is is built into that, and then you know your pay per click on on Google. You know they're setting those bids. They're, you know, we're meeting once a quarter to talk about keywords, stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, we talk to groups who like they want to spend a hundred bucks on Google, or, which is better than nothing, but not really. Like you really gotta have a meaningful investment. Like you know your hats, two thousand hats, eleven bucks, what twenty thousand dollars? Like that's what it takes. Like you, if you're gonna do some of these marketing. Yeah really got to invest into it it's not cheap it's sort of a hard pill to swallow but you know you have 2500 a month of marketing spend what are some of the results that you guys are seeing yeah so in our area with 
you know, and it takes campaigns time to optimize too. So, you know, you talk about Google, it takes six months of spending money that you're not getting great returns on because it just takes time to optimize. So everybody should really be aware of that. You know, you're not throwing away bad money, but you're trying to, to get Google to understand you're real, that you have what people are needing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so consistently on the keywords that we're going after, we, we're ranking higher than United, Sunbelt, and, and all the other guys at the Knoxville area. Uh, I, yeah, they're, they're beating us out on other things, but it's, you know, it's, it's the keywords that they're, that they're looking to spend more money on that we are. But I, I think uh, I need to remember the term. It, it, this is not my wheelhouse. So, but we, we have a really high percentage of like success and click through rate on, on our ads. Gosh, I wanted to say, I, I hate to give anybody any bad information. I, I would, I would really need to talk to them and ask them what that exactly is. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you're high, high engagement. Um, you're seeing high ROI on, on the ad. And I think that's the, like the biggest thing people take away from this is like, you know, for 2,500 bucks a month, you, in the keywords you care most about, you are outranking United, Sunbelt. So when people search for equipment rental near me, Coca rentals at the top, top three. And the, the, the biggest thing you want to be in the top three for any search result. And if, there's a big drop off in number four, five, six, seven. And, you know, you're not spending $100,000 a month, right? You're spending 2500 a month, which is not nothing either. But like that amount of money, you know, search results are hyper local. So you're not, you don't care if you're ranking in Atlanta or uh, DC or California. Like you care about Tennessee. And in Tennessee for 2500 bucks a month, you can outrank United and Sunbelt and show up on people's searches. And I think from ARA's put out stats, you know, which we see as well, 80% of uh, rental transactions start with an internet search. They may not transact online, but they're going online to look at it. And, you know, what, what we see with the ARA sees as well, about 20 to 25% of all rental transactions are being done via e-commerce too, right? So you got to be, not just have a great e-commerce platform, but you got to be able to be found, right? Build it and they will come, doesn't apply to the websites necessarily, right? So um, I think you're on the leading edge of this stuff. We talked a lot about Ronald Cup, doing anything on internet marketing. I think it's a huge missed opportunity um, that you, you, you're, you're really taking advantage of. Yeah, you know, I would definitely agree with that. And I mean, to your point, the, the e-commerce thing is, is huge. So uh, we're, we're not quite there yet. You know, we bought our software. I think we went live in like 2020 or 2021. So we, we've been kind of ingrained in the software we're using. And, and they just now rolled out their, their online platform where people could do uh like an assisted reservation. And I'm sure most people understand that, you know, they, they can go, go through the whole booking process and, and pay for it, but it, it books them as a reservation instead of a rental, uh, just in case you can't fill that the next day or something, if they do it in the middle of the night. Yeah. And I think, I think you probably seen the stat that United Rentals put out, but they're, you know, they're saying 70% of their revenue in Q1 came from their digital channels. So that's the website and the app, 70% of the revenue. You know, we obviously we started Clipley four years ago around the thesis around online red thing, which we have seen have grown. Um, and I think at this point, uh, it used to be nice to have. It's becoming a must have. Like we're talking a lot of companies who are like, hey, I have actively losing customers to United or et cetera, because we don't have a way for the transact online or our website's not ranking, et cetera. And I mean, the fact that they're putting out that statement that 70 percent of their revenue, which is billions of dollars, is coming through their digital channels like that is the future. Right. And if you're not ranking on, on for search results, if you don't, if you're not being visible, right, you're sort of dead in the water before they e- can even get to your website, right? Yeah, no, I, I would say that's huge. I mean, I, if I had to throw a, just a guess out there, I would have never guessed that it was seventy percent. That is, that's a mega number. Yeah, that's that's what they're saying. Seventy percent. ARA came out. They said in 2022, they said seventeen percent of all orders were done online. In 2023, it was 25. percent so They've jumped from 17 to 25. That's what the ARA is seeing. We see that also in our system. Is about 25 percent of the hundreds of thousands of orders we've seen have come through online. So even still, the rest of the industry is not even at 70 percent yet. That sort of shows how the nationals are really driving a lot of innovation. They're pushing. They've got the mobile apps, customer portals. They're investing in. But I think that shows you where the market is going to go eventually, right? Because if they're at 70 percent, the industry's at 25. Over time, that's just going to creep up. Yeah, I'm, and I, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of tactic that goes into that. It, uh, you know, it leans to brand loyalty, uh, ease of use for customers. I mean, if you've got an app that customers can use almost flawlessly, they're going to do that probably a hundred times the one versus calling somebody. And not, not to say that, that anybody's introverted or extroverted, but 
I mean, if it's if it's quicker and it's easier, and you can just hit a couple buttons and bam, you're done. I, I think I think that speaks pretty pretty big volumes. Yeah, that's huge. And I don't want to miss that point. It's about ease of use. Like, it's not just e-commerce or no e-commerce. Like, there's a lot. Like, I mean, Amazon spent billions of dollars A/B testing. If you put the button half an inch higher and you make it a different color, like they see another million dollars of revenue. Like these little incremental things like really matter. United spending that money to do that. Sunbelt is spending that money to do that. Um, but I think that's where this is going. Like, you know, go back four years ago. Do we need to put prices online? Do we need online red thing? That was this. Now it's like, yes, you need that. We need to do that. I think we'll go the next five years. Like the ease of use really, really matters. And, you know, all of that, the, the, like the sophistication of how easy your website is, how fast it loads, you know, particularly on mobile, what we see also is 50% of all website traffic across our customers' websites are done on mobile phones. So it's like not even just looking good on a computer, but like being able to be fast and responsive on on a cell phone as well. So all those things add up, these little things that people don't really think matter, like they matter huge, uh, a, a ton and really can drive the difference between getting a rental and not getting a rental. Yeah, no, it does. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, the last time that I looked at our traffic, it was like 65 to 75% was mobile. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I, I do my own website. I don't pay anybody to do that. I do that just all myself. And, you know, for the longest time, I never even really thought about mobile until I just started looking at those numbers. And then my optimization changed. Like, I could care less what it looks like on a computer because, you know, 75% of the people that come there are on, on a phone. Yeah. And, and I think just consistently growing yeah i mean things are changing i i i think things have changed i mean i think to be honest there's a point of time where we like we wrong on the e-commerce thing because there's like a lot of people who weren't ready for it didn't want it and like we really question like is that really important in the rental industry i think the answer now is yes like i just think with in the last six months i've just felt it i've seen it like you see the data you see the numbers see the conversations you're having with people but you have to have a strong internet presence you have to have e-commerce you have to have strong internet presence you've invested in that I guess just to put a bow on the marketing side of things, like if you had to like summarize a piece of advice, if you're talking to a, you know, uh, maybe a Rodney of four years ago, you're sort of in that point, you're taking on debt, you're starting to grow the business. Like what advice would you give yourself or someone else who's thinking about getting into internet, internet marketing, investing into SEO, investing into paid ads? What advice would you give them? I, I would look at, I would look at the money as a long term strategy of, of helping you. Not not only to grow, but not miss out on losing money in the short term as well. Uh, I'll use this analogy actually from from a meeting yesterday. So uh, a, a a gentleman was kind of faced with the the choice of spending like fourteen thousand dollars for a headhunter to find a, a sales executive that he's looking for. So that's, that's a lot of money to drop on a headhunter to find one person. And you know, my first thought was like, wow, that's a lot of money. But your second thought is if it costs that much money to find that person, how much money are you losing in the short term by not having the person you're looking for? So, you know, if, if I could flip that over to advertising, SEO, anything like that, you're choosing not to spend that money because it looks like a sum of money. How much is it costing you right now that, that you're not spending? Because the formula works. You know, the obviously the old saying, you have to spend money to make money, but the formula of SEO investment Google advertising, Facebook retargeting, it all works. It drives customers. We get reports every Monday of how many people saw our ads, how many people clicked on them, how many people called directly into the store. We can listen to recorded conversations of how those calls went. If you're not spending the money to do that, you have none of that information. And if you have bad data or no data at all, how are you going to direct yourself? It's like you're, fl- you're flying blind. It's like the pilot who's going to like turn off all the uh, radar meeting. We're saying, hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to eyeball it. Like, I think we're going to go to New York. I think it's that way, right? Like, it's not the right way to yeah. run your business in 2024. Yeah. And I mean, you know, your gut can get you a really, really long way. It can. You know, my gut got me a, a good ways. But, you know, once you get to a certain scale, your gut essentially is no good. Like, I mean, yeah, you can, you can base some things off of it. But if you're going to make gut decisions, you know, it's fifty fifty shot if you're gonna make the right one where if you have good data, you're gonna make a lot better decisions if you have the good data to input to what decisions need to be made, whether it be purchasing equipment, selling equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Totally agree. I think early on, 
you got to rely on gut. There's no data. Like, you know, what data would you have pulled for your website that didn't exist when you started, right? Like you can do market research, but like you got to sort of trust your gut. You think there's an opportunity to start a rental company in East Tennessee, right? And you trusted your gut. You did that. But as you scale and how do we, how do we go to, you know, the, you know, from we've done zero to one, how do you go from one to 10 type, type of thinking? That's when you have to rely on data. And if you're not investing into marketing programs, you're not having that data, right? If, over half your customers, as A-Ray says, 80% of your customers are going to your website, you're missing out on 80% of data points potentially, right? And that's the key for how you can really you know, go to the next level. So I think the internet marketing stuff is like imperative. I, I, we talked about a lot on this and like, you know, we quickly as 90% of our leads are referrals or inbound marketing. Like we are, you know, um, it's easy to get hooked on the drug and you got to do outbound too, like with handing out hats and driving around, like you got to do that part too. But in 2024, like, and it's a huge opportunity because we've talked to a lot of rental companies who are doing nothing. Even the fact that you're doing something, a thousand bucks a month, like you are in the top 20% of rental companies just by doing that. And it's still an opportunity to have some arbitrage because eventually everyone will catch up to that. Yeah. Uh, pretty low hanging fruit. And, uh, you know, just with the, you know, the 2,500 you're spending, you've seen a lot of traction from it is what it sounds like. Yeah. 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 We consistently see traction. The c- campaigns continue to optimize. They, they get more relevant. It, it's not, it's been a great investment. I, uh, you know, they talk about investing, you know, the, the best time to start investing was 10 years ago, but the next best time is today. And, and I think about my advertising the same way. I wish I'd have started five years ago. Yeah. That's my dad always says best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Second plus time is best time is today. You know, yeah. uh, I he constantly, even I think about our business, which is, you know, half the uh, duration of yours, you know, three and a half, four years in your seven, eight years in uh, the, you know, we made a lot of bad mistakes, but when you've made it, any of the good decisions we made, I always wish we'd done it earlier. And I think you sort of can share that sentiment, right? Um, so I love that when I, we first talked, I love to hear how much you guys are investing into the marketing side of things. And, um, you know, you've had a lot of success with that. I think last, uh, we wrap up here, I know we're just r- b- running out of time here, but, um, you know, I was, we emailing back and forth, you know, one of the things that stood out to me, you had a Bible verse in your uh, e- email signature, uh, Colossians 3, uh, 23, 24. And one of the last parts of that is it says, is this the Lord Christ you are serving? And I, and I read down and I, said, I saw the serving part. I saw, you know, the first thing you've talked about throughout this episode is service and how important that is to you. Uh, how important is your faith to what you're building at uh, Coca Rental Company? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my faith is, is who I am. I mean, I, I grew up in church all my life. Uh, kind of had a period where I, I stepped away. I was working 70 hours a week at, at Ace. Yeah, I didn't have time for much other than work, eat, sleep. Um, but you know, the the Lord convicted me, got back a hold of me, and uh, Colossians three twenty three is actually on our mission statement about service. Uh, yeah, so we, our mission and our biz, vision are, are based off of two verses. But um, but yeah, it you know it, it defines who I am. I, I think most people would would tell you that if not that verse in particular, but I mean, I try to I try to live my life out in that. The best way that I can, uh, you know, I've made some pretty poor decisions. Uh, I would, I would dare to say that that I would take them back if I could. But, uh, but outside of that, man, you know, faith, faith is what makes me. Uh, it's what gives me the courage to to be scared to death, but to hop on the horse and, and take a ride anyways. You know, but, uh, whether that be, you know, just taking that leap in faith and spending that marketing money when I've never done that before, or taking on uh, the big SBA loan to, to encapsulate everything. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm proud of what you've been building, Ronnie. It's been cool these last few years to know you and see and the success. And, you know, even we tracked signups for these episodes. We had a ton of uh, people interested in hearing your story. Um, Cause I think a lot of people can relate to someone, you know, um, had a, had a dream, had a vision and went for it. Right. And it's scary. You know, you take on the loans, the, the money, you got to keep going every day. I would get rejected. Something bad happens. Right. Um, and you got to just keep going. And I think what I really like about you is you're authentic. You know, you, you, you know, you, you're yourself in your personal life and in your workplace. I think bring it back to Nick Saban one more time. You know, I'm a, I'm a Clemson Dabo fan, uh, you know, football. And I remember uh, they asked Dabo, like, what's the best advice uh, he got? And it was from Nick Saban. He said, the biggest thing I would just uh, advise you is to be yourself because they hired you for a reason and don't try to be someone else, you know, just be who you are. And uh, you know, that's what I love to see about what you're doing. You know, you're doing it your way. You know, some people may be turned off by you having a Bible verse on your email signature or your business card, like, and you're okay with that because you're going to be who you are and you're going to run the business 
the way that you want to. And by doing that, you're going to attract the right people. You know, you're not going to uh, attract the wrong people. You're going to be who you are and um, ultimately biz- build your business that way. So I uh, just want to encourage you on that. And, I, and I'm just, like I said, I just feel love, love to follow along on your journey the last few years. Yeah, no, I greatly appreciate that. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're not trying to, not trying to push our faith on anybody, but it, it definitely, it attracts the right employees that we're looking for, uh, people that share the same values that we do, you know, the, the service mindset, teamwork mindset, it, it, you know, it works for us. It may not work for anybody else. You know, it, it may not be what they're comfortable to do, but I, I'll tell you, I get more, more people that will email me back with a compliment of like, I, I loved your Bible verse. Uh, thank you. I needed to read that today. I, I get more of those. I, like, I don't know that I've ever had anybody negatively write back to me on anything, but, but I've had a lot of positive remarks and whether I'm, I change them every now and then, whether it's on my phone or, or on the computer, but I, I try to just periodically update them just to, to give people encouragement too. Yeah. If people are turned off by that, there's other rental companies out there, right? And you're not going to worry about that. You're going to do, you're going to be yourself and, and just go that way. So, um, Anyways, th- thanks for coming on today, Ronnie. It's been awesome hearing your story about the internet marketing and sort of getting going from the beginning and love how lean you're keeping it. You're putting every dollar you can into growing the business. And I don't know, I got to buy some hats. But that's my takeaway. I think buying yeah. hats, a lot of money. You got 2,000 hats. <laughs> Something. Yeah. Well, just just keep in mind, we don't buy 2,000 in one whack. We'll we'll buy like 500 at a time. And just, you know, throughout the year, we'll we'll have about 2,000. So it, it's not a single expense that we, we dock uh, at one time. But yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on here. I, I hope that, that it was uh, able to help somebody, bless somebody to get to, you know, give them the courage to take the next step or, you know, maybe, maybe they've been in business for 20 years and, and they're not doing something and they, you know, they may think that they want to try something else out. You know, it's, it's, uh, sky's the limit. Yeah. Well, I, I always learn something from our guests too. And I def- definitely learned a lot today. So, um, thanks again, Ronnie and everyone, everyone listening, this will be on Spotify, YouTube, Apple music in, a, in about a couple of weeks. So you can re-listen to it at that point and share with friends and colleagues so um thanks everyone for joining the questions and ronnie thanks again for your time today appreciate it kyle thanks man sounds good see you everyone